can't determine whether it is domestic or foreign, but that is what we're moving around. And this data is not from our 820. So we do have an annual survey where we look at the last 100 plus miles that crude makes its way to a refinery, and the refinery uh, identifies for us the mode. That's different. That's orders of magnitude smaller than this because of rail and barge and other modes are used in multimodal transfers of crude that don't get reflected unless they cross what we call a pad border. And for those who aren't aware, it's Petroleum Administration for Defense Districts. But I just wanted to show that. You can see the huge growth in rail. Um, it's, it's a 60 times what it was in 2010, which is just enormous. But it's, it seems to be plateauing. So what I wanted to show here is um, we also have a lot of maps on our website that um, I think many of you have seen. This one is coming from our drilling productivity reports, which is a very convenient way of just dis presenting what's going on with shale and tight oil plays. So we've got this, the top seven here, and we put out a monthly report that looks, most of our data is a good two months old. Um, but this report tends to stay current, so plus one. So the current report actually includes data through October. But what you see here is the pad borders and those um, plays. And now I'll wipe away the pad names and then start layering on um, some infrastructure. So first I'll start with the refineries and you can see how they're located nowhere near um, where, the, in, in many cases, nowhere near the plays. And then if we start looking at where the crude oil pipelines, now this is not every single pipeline, these are the big <coughs> interstate pipelines, nothing gathering, okay? And if we see where they are, plus the blue is indicating uh, water, high, you know, um, rivers that are actually moving petroleum, you can see that everything is hemmed in basically by between the Appalachian and the Rocky Mountains. So how are you going to get anything beyond there to refineries located on the coast and elsewhere is through rail. And so these little green um, diamonds are where we're seeing both the loading and the unloading terminals. Now this is another way we've been trying, we've been trying to find interesting ways to show how the modes play against one another. And one of the problems is I can't show much in the way of waterborne because on interpad movements it just doesn't show up enough. But this is a picture of 2010. This is roughly where the crude was going by pipeline. So you can see the majority is coming from the south in the Gulf up to the Midwest and also into Cushing where it was then getting shifted other ways. Um, a lot of it intrapad. And if we sort of trans, make it more transparent, the um, pipeline movements, and layer on rail back in 2010, you can see how small the rail movements really were. Uh, you can see the dot there at the upper corner of pad two showing Bakken coming out, heading to either the west coast or a little bit to the east coast, more of it heading south. I'm not showing any of the intra-pad movements, which you can see on our website, but this gives you a sense of the order of magnitude that we're dealing with there. Fast forward to 2014, you can see how much um, the crude oil pipelines have gone down. The, um, the amount coming out of the south is almost smaller in some regards than the stuff coming from the north-south. And so we saw a shift between reversals, new construction projects, just changes overall that really changed the whole complexion of pipeline movements. Layer on your rail and make the uh, pipeline more transparent and you can see how rail really took over the, um, the Midwest to East Coast um, movements as well as to the West Coast, less so going to the Gulf. Now, what does it displace? Various things. The East Coast is displacing non-Canadian crude imports. But I just wanted to show you that because I'm kicking it off and there are other gentlemen behind me who are going to speak about different modes more directly, just wanted to throw up also uh, a variety of places where you can go to look at our data. You can see the drilling productivity reports. The last link there is the one where we have crude by rail data available. 
And um, a few of you may be aware, we recently put out a Federal Register notice where we proposed some changes to our surveys and we're in the process of figuring out uh, what's going to happen next. But without further ado, I'll pass the torch. Thank you, Mindy. Our next panelist is David St. Amond. David is president of Navigistics Consulting, a consulting firm that specializes in commercial shipping. He produces the Wilson Gillette Report about the Jones Act product tanker market and the large articulated tug barge market. Try saying that quickly five times. And he also advises groups such as the National Academy of Sciences and the Coast Guard's Towing Safety Advisory Committee. David? Thank you. When we talked about the uh, product tanker market for the Jones Act, the single largest movement of product tankers and large ATVs, over about 140,000 barrels, is crude oil right now. 37% of the fleet is deployed in moving crude oil. And the single biggest movement of crude oil on Jones Act vessels is Eagle Ford from Corpus Christi to other Pad 3 locations, so it doesn't show up in Mindy's, <laughs> Mindy's volumes, as it's an intrapad move. And that's primarily inland waterways movements over to Houston and the eastern Texas refineries, as well as some inland movements along the Gulf and Intercoastal Waterway over to Louisiana, Mississippi type area. But the, the bigger vessels, the large ATBs, the ocean going ones, and the product tankers, their largest movement is over to the Louisiana area, either through loop or directly to refineries, with intermittent shipments up the coast to the northeast refineries in Pad 1. That does show up in EIA data. I just hit. So when we look at the, the fleet that I'm really addressing today, this is the fleet that excludes the Alaska North Slope tankers proprietary fleets, the producers, BP, ExxonMobil, and ConocoPhillips. It doesn't include their 11 tankers, but it does include one of 50,000 product tanker moving crude is deployed in Alaska, and there's typically one always deployed up there. But we have 33 tankers, 44 large barges, the fleet's at 77, and uh, it's getting ready to grow. It's been extremely tight. Recently, rates have gone as high as $120,000 a day on a relet of a single vessel for six months that uh, Coke was the big beneficiary because they had the underlying contract on it. And I think I mentioned this before, that the deployment of that fleet is 37% in crude oil. It went from basically 3% or less four or five years ago up to 37%. Right now there is no availability of a Jones Act tanker for term charter. Every product tanker is on term charter. There are two that are coming up free at the end of December. Everybody's waiting to see what they go for. The last deal done for a Jones Act product tanker was a military seal of command, which chartered one for $95,000 a day. Consider that the same tanker in international trade would probably be getting about $20,000 a day. Uh, if we look at the two-year change, you can see some of this dramatic shift. From 2013, we had 26% of the fleet in crude oil, it's gone up to, as I said, 37. The fleet capacity has on, only grown from 18.5 million barrels of capacity up to 20, and that's primarily the addition of two former ANS tankers moved down into the lower 48 crew trade, and we had delivery of two large ATBs, a 250 and a 155,000 barrel ton tanker. Oh. On this thing, if a tanker is in the West Coast service and crude oil trade, and there are three that flip in and out, but it's basically one full-time equivalent, they're included in the West Coast category, but that's a constant, so it doesn't impact the change that we're seeing here. Now, the big thing going on in this business is there's been a lot of constrained demand in the business because there wasn't availability. That's 
A lot of that has been taken up by, people call it shadow demand, but it's crude oil has been the highest and best use for these vessels, so they've moved out of, and also because of the crude oil export ban, you can export gasoline and clean products, so we can export those on foreign flag tankers, and then we import the same amount into Florida primarily, because there's no pipelines that go to Florida. So that's kind of the balancing point, given our tight, extremely tight supply position. There are firm orders right now for 16 product tankers, which will start being delivered in the next two months. They'll all be delivered by 2018. I think I have a list of them on the next page. Eight large ATBs, and that represents 34% of the fleet capacity. It'll be interesting to see how that gets absorbed. If you look at the supply over time, this is my projection. You see the initial run up to 2017 with the deliveries. And then we do have some older vessels, some converted ATVs, which will probably be coming out of the trade with age. But that's going to depend on what rates are like and what people are willing to spend and what oil company and charters are willing to charter. There's a lot of vetting goes on, a lot of issues regarding safety. Now here's the scary chart as I tell ship owners, but to charterers, I say this is a good chart. If you keep building tankers the way the shipyard capacity is for Jones Act, they can build up to four product tankers a year between two shipyards, Ocker, Philadelphia, which is about to change their name to Philly Shipyard, and then General Dynamics, NASCO. Those are the only two yards building tankers. You can build ATBs and a few more. Some of them are building up on the Great Lakes at Bay, and then you have a few you have Gunderson on the west coast and then a few builders, uh, Halter Marine down on the uh, Gulf Coast. But what we show here is if you start building anywhere near capacity, and this chart is based on a two per year out of the major shipyards, you can see that the supply can start going through the roof. And this is keeps everything retiring at expected retirement ages of about 30 years for vessels. And again, we're probably going to change from what we consider to be a completely supply constrained demand situation now to by 2020 or earlier, we will be in a demand constraint. Rates are currently well above fully compensatory rates, meaning that if somebody Built a ship today, costs about $145, $150 million all in for a new order. A uh, charter rate of about $65,000 a day would provide a ship owner at an 8% return if he got $65,000 a day constant for the next 25 years or the life of the ship after tax return. And so we've, we've gone well beyond that in current rates. That's it. Great, thank you. Our next presenter is John Schmitter, founder of KEP, a consulting firm that helps energy companies and retailers solve transportation problems. Before founding KEP, John worked at DTE Rail Services, Southern Pacific Railroad, Conrail, and other intermodal and trucking companies. He's also an adjunct professor of supply chain management at the Daniels College of Business at the University of Denver. John? Thanks, Nicole. Good morning. Um, I'm going to talk to, 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 to you this morning a little bit about the, uh, the rail industry and, and trying to put the rail movement of, of crude oil into, into perspective, how, they, how the railroads view uh, capacity, what the implications are for service, and to get, give you a few uh, few few takeaways. How do we make the? Uh, I guess that would make sense. Okay. Uh, in the United States and 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 Canada, the the, the railroad industry is uh, is concentrated. In the U.S., there are basically four large what's known as Class One railroads: two in the east and two in the west. There are uh, there are two uh, two railroads in, uh, in 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 Canada as well. Um, s some of these uh, some some rail locations are served by more than one railroad, but for the most part, 
most rail serve locations are captive to, to, to one railroad. Um, all of these companies are private companies. Um, that is their, uh, that is their uh, and they run on infrastructure that they supply themselves as opposed to every other mode which operate on, on, on government or government provided in infrastructure. Um, it, it, it's, important to, it's important to understand that because the, uh, um, it, it does have implications for capacity. All of these companies have investors that demand a return on the investment they make in that capacity. They are some of the most uh, uh, capital intensive industries there, there, there are. The, uh, there's very, very lightly regulated by the, in the U.S. by the Surface Transportation and Board and in Canada by the, the Canadian Transportation Agency. So what you have is an industry that is a capacity constrained, lightly regulated monopoly. From a business perspective, it doesn't get any better than that. Um, to, put the, uh, to put the movement of, of, of crude oil in, in, in perspective, it has been a, a tremendous, tre tremendous growth in, in this in this commodity for uh, for, uh, for for U.S. Uh, for U.S. railroads. Um, but when you when you look at overall, even with with all the growth, it still represents a very very small part of uh, of overall of our overall rail traffic. So you know the the, the question I usually get asked is there is there going to be rail capacity to uh, you know to handle all this business? You know, railroads handle 30 million carloads a year. So yeah, there is there is. So there obviously is, is capacity to haul really all the crude oil you, you, uh, you would want to move. Um, but there is, uh, there, there, is, there is competition for, uh, for, for that capacity. Um, that, that the first competition comes from the, uh, the, the actual shareholders in, in, the, uh, in, in the railroads. You, you have um, capacity is, uh, cap, uh, capital investment for capacity expansion is it is provided by, by cash flow when you have competition for that cash flow from the investors who, who want a return uh, of, of that investment, or some of it anyway, in, 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 in share buybacks, uh, in dividends, of, of so, and so forth. All of, the, all of the companies have to invest for growth. They, uh, they, they, uh, they're, they're, their investors are, are, are pushing them, but they have uh, a very, very tight, a very, very tight Leash. Wall Street has very, very tight leash on these on these companies. But you can see even so that the, uh, with a few exceptions, most of them invested more in uh, more of the capital, more of their cash flow in in, in capex than than they did in uh, share share buybacks and and dividends. Uh, but just to also put it in perspective, this isn't all for capacity expansion. Uh, the capital needs to just keep these railroads running at the same rate they're running now is more than a billion dollars a year for each of these for each of these companies. So it's very, 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 very capital investment uh, in intensive. Um, and, and this is a this is a fine balance. If you listen to the if you listen to the to the to the investor conference calls for these companies, the subject of of capex is is. Usually occupies most of the most of the uh, most of the conference call. Um, they're, they're, the questions are constant. Are you sure you're going to get the growth? Are you sure you really need to make this capital investment and uh, uh, and, and, and so forth? So you've got a uh, you've, you've got a kind of a fine balance, and and you know, investors are, are pushing them for growth. But um, but as, as soon as there is an indication that that um, that the investment in additional capacity won't produce the growth. Um, the investors are going to demand a much more, uh, a much larger share of that return. And you know what, what, what you know what could cause what could cause that? Um, poor prospects in the uh, in, in for growth in the key businesses. And you already see that happening now. Um, you know, coal is in a is long term decline. You've seen you've seen the, the crude oil drop off, and the, it's been uh, and, and traffic is generally down. So, so that's a paranoia, and you, you know, the, when, when you look at the next quarterly conference calls, there's going to be a lot of discussion about about uh, next year's capex capex plans. Um, the other paranoia is new regulations that would constrain their, the uh, railroads' pricing power, and any evidence that these railroads have overinvested and and uh, will start competing aggressively for for each other. In the best case, you got a duopoly situation, and the, these companies act like true the true economic definition of, of duopolists. Um, 
You've also got, from a crude oil perspective, competition from, you know, from, from, other, uh, from other commodities. Uh, but based on the, the, the margins that the railroads earn on, on crude oil, you can see that the, uh, the, you know, the average uh, uh, revenue to, to, uh, to, to cost ratio for the, uh, for the whole business is 153%. You can see crude oil is way out to the, to the left there, much higher than the average and amongst the, the, the highest margins that the railroads make on, on any business, more than, more than coal. Um, and you know, tra really trailing only chemicals. So when you know when you look at you know competition for other you know versus other commodities, crude oils you know stands in in, in pretty good shape. Uh, so it, you know over time the uh, you know we don't have enough time to go into the into the entire history of the uh, industry or, or modern history of the industry, but. Um, you know, over, over time, since they were essentially deregulated in, in, in 1980, you know, the railroads, uh, what, what one of the uh, railroad analysts, uh, uh, my friend Tony Hatch, calls the grand bargain that, hey, you know, you let us, you free us to, you know, to, uh, to, to price as, 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 the, uh, as, as we're able to in the market, you know, we'll make the capital investment in the infrastructure and we'll improve, we'll improve the, uh, uh, you know the the service and give you the capacity you need and and in fact that you know that has happened and you know the uh, but as but as as prudent managers they're you know they they you know they it's it's to their advantage to keep capacity expansion on a just in time basis so for them for so for the most part these railroads don't have uh, a, a excess track capacity and locomotives sitting around and crews just waiting to to handle the next four or five un percent unexpected increase in demand. Unlike the regulated electric utility industry, there is no requirement that the railroads provide that excess capacity or that surge capacity. There is no uh, the, the government doesn't have the ability to specify a certain level of service uh, or, or any of that. So the railroads are investing on, basically, they aren't investing for what they see growth coming to be in 2025. They're investing for what growth they expect in 2016. So it's, uh, it's on a just in, in, in to really just on a, on a just in time basis. So rapid vol and unexpected volume increases are gonna cause problems for them. And you know, you know a year and a half ago, the whole system basically broke down with a 5% increase in, in demand. You had you know, the crude oil growing like, like crazy. You had an unexpected uptick in the movement of coal, and you had a, uh, a, a, record, a record grain harvest. Everyone, everyone attributed it to the uh, polar vortex and, uh, and the, the bad winter in Chicago. The service problems happened long before the winter. And, and that wasn't it. The, the issue was capacity. Chicago, you know, the, 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 the winter didn't help. But, uh, but that, I mean, that is a, that is a, fundamental, uh, a fundamental part of the, uh, of, the, of the business now, that uh, the railroads are just not, they, they do not have the, uh, the capacity or the ability to respond to, uh, to, to rapid increases in demand. It takes three months just to hire a, 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 a new crew, the acquisition of locomotives, uh, is a year-long process, and the, obviously the installation of, of track and so forth is much uh, uh, is, is, is much more than that. Um, things of the things are starting to get to get better from a service standpoint, and you know you can see as volume dropped off, the velocity of the system started to increase. Ser service is better, but it is temporary, and and the, you know the railroads are are, are getting pressure and right now to to start cutting costs, and they start to lay off crews. It's put locomotives in storage, so you know you're gonna you're gonna see uh, uh, you know service essentially uh, track track back to the uh, back to the mean. So 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 what does all this mean? Um, there you know there's gonna be uh, there's gonna be periods of um, uh, of, of of congestion res resulting. I mean, it could a, a severe disruption in the uh, in the uh, in the in the supply chain. The um, the uh, and the, you know there'll be periods when when volume drops off and the uh, and and the service gets a lot better, but it's uh, all all of those things are are, are are temporary. So it's not just about and and you know the railroads will increase the uh, increase prices as uh, as as the uh, as as the market allows. Um, there are no real regulatory constraints on 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 what they can do. Um, you know, if you're a if you're a if you're a, a, a crude oil shipper, it's really not about capacity for the industry as a whole. It's capacity for your train, today's train, tomorrow's train, the uh, yeah you know, the next day's train. So it, it requires a uh, an intense uh, intensive management effort. 
and you know how you uh, how you manage the uh, the not only the the relationship with your with your railroad, but also with the uh, your inventory levels. And so you might end up you might end up keeping uh, higher levels of inventory than than. Uh, than, than what you would you would otherwise want to do, <clears throat> or certainly that the uh, that the business units within uh, uh, you know within your energy companies would would want, um, and it's uh, and you know the, so that the the, um, uh, you know, the bottom line is that you, the, you should not always assume that capacity to move by rail is going to be available when you need it. You have to plan accordingly. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. Our last presenter is Dan Eberhardt, CEO of Canary LLC, an oil field services company. Dan has built Canary into one of the biggest private oil field services companies in the country by overseeing the acquisition of eight companies, and he's responsible for operations, finance, budgeting, capital spending, and integration efforts. Uh, thank you, Nicole. Um, good morning, everyone. So. Uh, my name is Dan Eberhardt, and I'm with an oil field service company called Canary, and um, I'm here, to, here today to talk about the crude oil export ban. Uh, before, before I get into that, though, um, I just want to give a couple of comments about Canary and a couple of data points. So, you know, our, our kind of core competency is the wellhead business. We do do a bunch of different oil field service activities, but and we're the largest um, independent wellhead company in the U.S., uh, North America onshore, we have roughly 9% market share. So uh, that's kind of where I'm coming from when I say this. But so, uh, you know, our experience this year um, just has been, you know, in terms of our capital expenditures, we've cut that to um, uh, spending is going to be about 11% of in 2015 of what it was in 2014. And that's basically what we kind of think our maintenance CapEx number is. Um, that's one data point. Um, additionally, um, you know, our pricing has moved uh, down roughly 17 or 18 percent for our kind of average 2015 pricing versus where, where it was in 2014. Uh, so that's an additional data point. And then the third uh, thing I wanted to say was that, um, you know, we're, our, our operating margins um, were uh, in in 2014 in the 22 23 percent range between there and we're you know currently experiencing this year uh operating margins in the the 14 to 15 percent range so um those are just a kind of a couple of data points about our experience as kind of a medium-sized private business out there in the oil field service uh business today um with that said uh how, how many of you guys are familiar with the crude oil export ban and the the current attempts to repeal it just so I know kind of what folks understand is. Okay, all right, thanks. Um, as I'm sure you know, uh, late last month, the price of West Texas Intermediate, the American benchmark fell from a six year low, dip, dipping below the $40 point, which is I think, a, a, uh, like I said, a six year low. Interestingly enough, at the same time that the bottom was falling out of the barrel, so to speak, both crude oil production and stockpiles continue to rise across the Midwest and Canada. Uh, but, it, but it's a fact there's a, a worldwide oil glut right now, as everyone knows, and historically low prices, you know, are coupled with a weakening global energy demand uh, and, and potentially uh, a lack of growth coming from China. There's a veritable Bermuda's Triangle worth of market problems uh, from an energy producer and oil field service company perspective, any one of them capable of, you know, further crippling the North American energy industry beyond where it currently is. Uh, yet, because of greater oil field efficiency and other dynamics, uh, crude oil inventory levels continue to be uh, stagnant or rising, um, especially with product coming from places like the Bakken Shale. The, re the, the net result is that producers are parking more and more crude in storage tanks, hoping to both demand and prices recover. Uh, by Genscape's own estimation in August, stockpiles reach record levels in both Canada and the U.S. In Western Canada, for example, about 58% of the nation's 46 million barrel storage capacity was being used. In the United States, the figure was even higher, and we're, we're close to 70 or 80 year uh, highs, which is, is pretty remarkable when you think about it and, and probably means we're at all time highs. Um, you know, pinning the, the blame for the backup on OPEC 
or other petrostate uh, producers it, it is easy in times like this. It's clear that the cartel was fearful for all of our rising inter, uh, energy dominance in shale in the U.S. As the, the last speaker in the, the, the session previously that I was uh, in the audience for uh, talked about, uh, but it's, it's clear that they're after market share, they're after markets, and they're also attempting to kind of break the back of U.S. shale. Uh, but pointing the finger at someone else only gets us so far, and the American energy complex um, you know, needs a, a plan and solution and a, and a go forward path. Um, it's time we recognize that an internal, internal force behind the, the backup and getting crude out of places like the Bakken and, and others is um, exacerbated by an archaic piece of American energy policy called the crude oil export ban, which was put in place in the mid-1970s in response to the uh, 1973 oil embargo. Um, not only is the crude oil export ban holding our energy back, it's holding us back uh, economically and geopolitically as well. The crude oil export ban uh, dates back to the fuel hungry days of the 1970s, as I said, uh, but it was put in place in a time of energy scarcity uh, that, that's really much different from where we are today, particularly in the context of U.S. shale and what we've accomplished since 2008, 2009 in rising the production levels. Uh, for much of the time between yesteryear's energy famine and today's petroleum feast, the fact that we had an, have an export ban it has been something of a non-issue because, um, as Mindy said, you know, we're, we're, still, a net, we're still a net importer um, of production. Um, I, I think it's time for, I think it's time for a change. Um, I've been pushing for this uh, policy change for about two years now, and the, the ice cube is definitely melting, and I definitely think that we're uh, getting the crude oil export ban repealed um, has a lot of momentum right now uh, for reasons I'll talk about in a minute. But basically, um, you know, I, re repealing the crude oil export ban is not a solution to an oil, you know, an oil and gas company hitting their numbers in Q3 or anything like that. It's a medium-term, long-term solution. But what it, what it is acting right now as is a wet blanket on larger companies making long-term investments, particularly offshore, particularly in new fields and particularly in new technologies in the American energy complex, it's retarding medium and long-term investment. And it's something that um, I think the policymakers need to look at. And we, if we could use the current low price environment to remove this barrier, I think it uh, enhances the growth profile for the growth profile for the energy industry in, in the medium and long term. So the world has taken notice. As the, as the British Journal, The Economist put it, when the economic textbooks of the future are written, America's ban on crude oil exports will be a fine example of the perverse effects of pr protectionism. So those perverse effects include making today's producers face equally unsatisfactory economic choices, leaving oil in the ground or pumping it out at depressed prices. We know which one they've chosen. The storage tanks are proved, even though the discount's pretty steep. In fact, it's been estimated that the export ban keeps American crude measured by West, the West Texas Intermediate Benchmark anywhere from between $5 and $10 below the world price. On the other hand, um, experts in the Baker Institute and, and other places say if the crude oil exports were allowed, the spread between the grades would disappear. Um, better yet, uh, for a lot of folks that produce in the Bakken, the Bakken shale is of higher quality than WTI. Um, and so that, that could have profound implications there, uh, assuming the takeaway capacity existed. Um, a lot of people don't know this, but there, there's a much tighter correlation between uh, uh, gasoline prices at the pump are priced on Brent, not WTI. And there's a, a lot of misconceptions about that, or a lot of people don't think about it or don't know it. So the price you pay at the pump is, not, uh, is, is more tied to Brent than it is to WTI. There's a stronger correlation because it's the, the refined product is trading on the world market and that's, and that's what's determining the pricing. Um, and most folks think that the, the delta between WTI and Brent will collapse or nearly collapse once the oil export ban uh, is repealed or if it's fully repealed. And so there's really out there in the marketplace today, you can look at those two data points and basically say, this is what the ban is costing us. This is what's, what's gonna happen. Um, so, so I've met with and talked about, or I've, I've met with um, 15 members of Congress and the Senate on this issue, kind of briefing them and talking to them and answering their questions. And, and their primary concern, well, the, their primary concern always is getting reelected, right? 
but is, you know, what will this do to gas prices? And that's the main thing, I think, kind of holding this issue back from people getting on board with it. They don't want to vote for um, the ban to be lifted and the gas prices rise. And so what I tell them is everything else being equal, everything else being equal, the gasoline price is going to stay the same or fall. And that's because of what I just told you about uh, the price being correlated to Brent. And if you put more supply on the world market, what ha more supply equals what? The price is going to stay the same or fall. Just economics 101, right? Um, and that, that argument generally, at least they, they seem pretty receptive to. Um, but then again, you know, it's, it's also the case of, you know, oil is, you know, while we're in this session right now, oil is moving, right? So you can't really say if you do this, then this with regards to the export ban, you know, by itself, because, you know, some other macro considerations could, could completely move the needle. And that's, I think, what the, what the members are afraid of. But, um, you know, imagine that we were able to engage in free trade with the oil and gas, you know, like other, you know, like chairs or cherries or light bulbs or, you know, any, any other uh, good. Um, you know, Bach and oil and U.S. oil could reach markets like India, which imports 80% of its domestic consumption, or Japan, which imports nearly all of its or all of its domestic consumption. You know, both of those both of those countries uh, have asked for price concessions from OPEC in exchange for long-term contracts because they feel like they don't have a choice. Um, I think more more oil in the marketplace could potentially give them more more choice, um, and it could also flow you know cross flow to China and some of the other Asian or some of the Asian countries as well. Uh, that import and have political kind of political differences with local pe producers in the region, such as Indonesia. Um, there's also the geopolitic political considerations with the EU's dependence on oil uh, from from Russia. There you go. Um, you know, Mo Moscow has a virtual stranglehold on the EU, on the EU, particularly natural gas, but also to some extent. Um, also to some extent with, with oil and gas. You know, um, geopolitical reasons for energy diversity. Being energy independent is, of course, something we all know about. And, you know, the last five presidents have all talked about energy independency. Well, we're not there yet, but uh, with the rise of U.S. shale, we are on the doorstep of potentially five years or 10 years or 15 years from now. Uh, it's something that could be very possible. Um, in, in the U.S. in 2014, we, we imported only 27 percent of the petroleum consumed here, uh, according to some statistics, and nearly half of that is from our allies, uh, Canada and Mexico. If, if we were able to offer, you know, crude, crude for the export market, in addition to the pricing dynamics, it could also provide geopolitical stability in the region and could be used as another um, foreign policy tool for our leaders. Uh, a study earlier this year by the consultants at IHS said that uh, free trade and crude would boost American output, investment, jobs, uh, profits um, by a lot, and GDP by potentially as much as $86 billion. Uh, I've seen other statistics that say that, um, and, and I think, uh, in all fairness, I think these statistics were before the oil bust, so probably you need to be toned down some, but said that within two years of, of reducing or repealing the ban, uh, up to potentially 300,000 jobs and uh, GDP impact in the, the 30 to $40 billion range. Um, I think maybe you cut those numbers in half or something with the, the current market environment. But I think the, um, I think this is a policy that makes sense. I think this is something we should uh, continue to push. And I think it's, I think the time is right. There's a House bill. Um, H.R. 702, uh, that's going to be, it was supposed to be voted on last week. It's been pushed with this Boehner stuff, but I think it's going to be voted on in October still. Um, and I think that's expected to pass. The real rub is in the Senate, and um, there are potentially the votes there um, if, um, if it comes up to the floor for a vote. It's been uh, the Senate Natural Resources Committee, headed by Lisa Murkowski, has, uh, it, it's gotten out of committee and is uh, basically sitting on Mitch McConnell's desk. So, um, I, I think the time I think the time is ripe, and I think that while this won't uh, be immediately impactful for the U.S. energy complex, uh, explore, uh, exploration and production companies, and um, oil field service companies, I do think it would uh, potentially um, allow the industry to grow more in the medium and long term. 
Um, the the main the main uh, net losers for this policy are the independent refiners. Most of the larger um, oil and gas companies that have both uh, upstream and refineries are for lifting the ban. I think it's overall a net net benefit for them. Um, the, the the so the real net losers would be the the refineries. Um, they're basically getting the the profit spread between the the delta and the two prices right now. So it's not, and this is something like you you have that I that I've also pushed with the members of Congress. But it's it's really um, the consumers are not the net beneficiaries of this. It's it's really being captured by the refiners who've had kind of kind of excess profits because of this law. So my main point in summary is that. Um, with the prices being low, it's kind of a good time to push this policy through, and I think it's a net beneficiary for the American energy complex and will lead to more, uh, more jobs in the economy and more investment in America. So uh, thank you for your time. Okay. Great. Thank you. That's okay. <laughs> I just realized, I, did I introduce myself? I'm Nicole Friedman. I cover energy markets for the Wall Street Journal. Um, I want to thank everybody for their presentations. And I'm going to kick off the Q&A. I have a lot of questions here to ask, but please chime in with your own questions, because there's so many topics we could talk about. So I'm interested in really focusing on what you all want to hear. Um, to start, I'd love to just get an overview of kind of what's coming in these alternative forms of transportation, because one of the big appeals of railroads and barges and trucks in the past couple of years has been that they were already there. And in a lot of the regions where shale oil is being produced, the pipelines or sufficient pipelines weren't there. But a lot of new investments have been made, new pipelines have been built, and more are still on the way, already under construction. And something that I'm starting to hear a lot about is talk of pipeline overcapacity and overbuild and the idea that we'll have more than enough takeaway capacity for the oil that's being produced in the Bakken and elsewhere, especially as production is now starting to decline. So I'd love to hear from our panelists about what the role is for alternative forms of transportation in the next few years and how you know, new pipelines coming online, whether that will put the brakes on growth in crude by rail, growth in barge, and other forms of shipping? Well, I'll kick it off. So from EIA's perspective, um, most of you are aware, we do uh, transportation mode in our historic data, but we don't get into it much when it comes to forecasts. But we have been tracking what's going on. And you'll see um, from the pipeline data that, you, uh, that we have, that the amount is increasing, and it's increasing significantly, but it's nowhere near the capacities, if you believe the data that comes out from some entities like North Dakota Pipeline Authority. So if you see the data that Justin puts out and accumulates up on the capacity that's being installed, and then you look at the volumes that are moved on a month-to-month -month basis from us, you can see that there's a huge disconnect. And then you'll hear from people like Rusty Brazil and others that pipelines are grossly underutilized. I wish I could say that you would see it all from our data, but you won't. Um, what you can track is simply what's going on volumetrically. Um, I, I, uh, I have some comments. So um, in, we, we do uh, an awful lot of work in the Bakken, and, and I think that in the, in the past, the, the, there's been a huge discount for Bakken crude due to the takeaway capacity. And I think that that's really, um, to some degree in the downturn acting as, as a, uh, a floor on uh, how much the Bakken is gonna be affected in terms of production because as, as the price has fallen and the, the drilling has fallen, there's been more, actually more takeaway capacity coming online. So in, in effect, I think that the, the I'm looking for the, the Bakken discount to continue to kind of uh, converge with the, the, the pricing for the, the rest of the crude produced in the country. And I think that that's, um, in, in, that's one of the ways I think the Bakken comes out of this, this uh, downturn in a relatively more competitive situation than some of the other plays in the U.S. So I'm basically saying the, the Bakken's history is a uh, high cost of production play. Uh, one of the main reasons for that being the takeaway capacity. Uh, I think that this downturn and the capacity coming online plus the taking rigs offline is going to dampen um, a lot of that. But Dan, are you talking pipeline or rail? 
Am I talking what? Pipeline or rail takeaway? I mean, that was really the, the question. Yeah, pi pipeline. You see, I, um, I disagree because where Bakken crude is desired is in regions where you can't be reached by pipeline. So um, part of the reason why rail did grow as much as it did is because East Coast refineries wanted the light crude. They wanted to substitute out their Nigerian imports. And it was very cost effective for them to bring it there, uh, especially with the differential between um, Brent and WTI. And I, I really think that you know rail won't go away because it takes the crude places where it needs to go and pipelines can't. I, uh, if I could just, just follow up with that, um, I, I, I understand and agree with what you're saying. Uh, I don't, I don't think rail goes, I don't think rail goes away. I think that it just changes the, the, the pricing dynamics a little bit. I think you have to look at the fact that we had to completely replumb our pipeline system that was developed entirely for getting imported crudes into refineries, mainly from through Loop or Louisiana, Texas facilities up to Cushing, and then the pipelines then fed up to Chicago and the Midwest refineries. Almost all of those, except for a couple big ones, have been reversed. To do that, you just turn the pumps around. And so we're still going through that replumbing phase and adding some more pipelines. And pipelines have virtually no origin destination flexibility, but they are the cheapest per mile move. Railroads are one of the more expensive modes, but they have the greatest flex origin destination flexibility. So it was a great gap filler. Uh, on the marine side, there are risks to the marine movements of new pipelines getting built, primarily a Houston or Cushing over to Louisiana, or if you reverse cap line which is just a, a 1.2 million barrel a day pipeline. It is probably moving about 100,000, 150,000 a day right now. And they're about to lose 100,000 of that with a new pipeline. So I think you have to look at the replumbing of the US. It's still going on. That has a lot to do with the WTI Brent spread. I think a better spread to look at if you're examining the export ban is the LLS versus Brent spread, and that's trading in just about parity because we're still importing a little bit of light crude into each of our pads right now. None to Texas, which is flooded with light crude, Permian and Eagle Ford, but still some into Louisiana, Atlantic Coast, and the West Coast. It's, it, let, me, let me just add a little bit from the, uh, from the, from the rail perspective. You know, when, 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 uh, when, when rail movements started in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in large volumes, the, uh, the, the majority went to, to the Gulf Coast. I mean, there was a shortage of pipeline capacity. The first rail destination terminals were built in, uh, in, uh, in St. James, Louisiana, and movements went to the Gulf Coast. Now, a lot as the pipeline capacity has been added going down there and you know the, and those you know that that those refineries basically you know reach their the limit of their appetite for 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 light crude um you know the 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 movements to the gulf coast of, of by rail have started to to, to slow down as the uh, the refineries on the east and west coast built the, the capability to handle rail more of it started uh, more of it started to to, to go there as, as as mindy said that and and uh you know that that was a result of the flexibility that the, the, the rail supply, the same, same railroad, the same, you know, essentially the uh, uh, same rail cars, same terminal facilities and so forth uh, at, at origin could, you know, could be used for movement to the, uh, to, to the east and, and, and west coast as well. There are still plenty of rail movements to the Gulf Coast and and to uh, and, and 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 both to the, to the east and the west coast, and to some extent, the, uh, the you know there's been investment in terminals, rail cars, and and uh, even some volume commitments in some of those places that have, have caused some of that to still move with, where it might might have uh, might have gone away otherwise. Are those rail movements to the Gulf Coast primarily uh, oil sands, or are they Bakken light oil? I had the impression it was mostly Canadian. Still um, there, there's still there's still um, there's still uh, a, a fair amount of, of Bakken oil uh, going down there. The uh, and you know the Canadian is Canadian is starting to move in in, in those uh, in those areas as well. So just to push you a little further on that, all of you. So it seems like yes, the consensus is there is a big threat to these other forms of transportation from the new pipelines coming online. But is it 
has, has it peaked? I mean, how much of a threat are we seeing to crude by rail, to crude by barge? Is it going to continue to decline, or will we see volumes of crude oil used in these forms of transportation continuing to fall? Is there a floor at some point below which we won't see further declines? Where, what, what are we expecting in the next couple of years? I'll give it a first shot. I, I don't think you're going to see pipelines from Bakken to either the West Coast or the East Coast, so that's going to continue by rail unless they can figure out a way to get it cheap, real cheap down to the Gulf Coast, and then you might want to put it on a, a ship to move around. I think from my mode, the, uh, the inland moves down the Mississippi virtually disappeared this year with the opening of a couple new pipelines coming down. and. Uh, the biggest risk is the movements from Eagle Ford over to Louisiana. If we open up some pipelines either from Cushing or reverse cap line to move Bakken down directly to Louisiana or started debottlenecking the problems of getting crude oil by pipe through Houston. You can't get there from here in that section. So I think there is pipeline developments still to be done that will significantly impact the waterborne movements, but not in the next five or so years. Um, we, when we release uh, data on crude by rail, we, we shoved out five years of data all at once so we could provide some context. Because uh, if we just started showing data as it was coming, it just, it, it didn't make any sense. So we don't know what the floor is. Because when you look back at 2010, it was really low. I mean, it, I think it was like, 13, it was, it was really, really small, the amount that was moved. And it was done. So I guess for rail, at least there is no floor. For pipelines, that's a whole different thing. And what we're seeing there is there'll be shifts. I mean, you, you see they can operate at reduced rates. You see that they can be um, swapped in direction. They can be twinned or untwinned. We could see any number of things. We see repurposed pipelines from gas to oil, from natural gas liquids to crude. It could go back and forth. Uh, maybe as new pet chem facilities are being built in the Gulf Coast, um, as well as on the East Coast, we could start seeing different types of products taking over where the crude was. It could be batched together. I mean, there's just different things that could happen. Um, I think it's very dynamic. Yeah, I think from a, you know, from a rail perspective, you look at most of the capital investment that was made in crude by rail was made by parties other than railroads. Um, and mostly, mostly by midstream companies who, who invested in, in, in origin terminals, refineries who invested in unloading terminals, midstream companies in, invested in, in, in rail cars, some refineries and, 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 and producers in, invested them as well. Now the railroads did, you know, it, it, especially the uh, especially BNSF in uh, in North Dakota did invest in some double track and they built some yards. But in in, in the great pot of capital that was invested to to, uh, to to enable the handling of crude by rail, a very small part of it was uh, was was made by railroads. And you know, the, some of those resources are deployable. The, you know, the crews that uh, the extra crews that they were handled can be moved elsewhere, or they they can be laid off and you see that happening now. The locomotives that are in that service can be, can be moved to other parts of their system and put in storage. What I would say, you know, the, the, the flexibility of rail is really good, but as I, uh, as I, as I said in my talk, if, the, if, the, if, the, uh, you know, if this, this goes on for a while and the, you know, the steady state becomes not a million barrels a day by rail, it becomes half a million barrels a day, um, and all of a sudden overnight, you know that the the, uh, you know, the 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 price of oil goes to 80 bucks, and the Brent TI spread is now 10 bucks. Uh, the next day, you're not going to have a million barrels a day of rail capacity. It'd be three, four, five. It could be six months before the railroads could re really handle it. So, if you're in the physical movement of these commodities, I would keep that in mind. So. Um, I I would just add, you know, you, you've also just got to look at total production, and then the the, the highest cost form obviously is you know likely to be the first to go away but the you know US production was like 9.6 million barrels a day in April and 9.3 million barrels a day in June so you know depending on where your you know uh, you know your forecast for the price of oil is going you know where is supply going to go and if supply continues to trickle down um, you know that's going to impact there's just going to be less less stuff to move period yeah absolutely so I'm curious we talked about rail being very very flexible to changes in production but what about 
the, on the marine side, how flexible is the market if U.S. oil production continues to decline and all of the investments you were talking about in your panel and the new, the new vessels being built, how much are those counting on growth in crude oil production? It's not a whole lot of flexibility to change modes of routing with a, a tanker. What we do expect to see is what we've been calling shadow demand in the movement of clean products from pad three over to pad one, primarily Florida, because there are no pipelines to go there. Florida is entirely dependent on waterborne movements of gasoline and other clean products, jet caro and distillate. So you may see some flexibility there in movement, but the other flexibility would be retirement of older equipment. I got a follow-up question for you because I was curious. You had mentioned um, that I guess the average age of a ship, it's retired at 30 years. There's no law about retirements, but in general when I'm doing my supply analysis, I assume a ship will last in a high rate environment till 30 years. We're seeing an international and dry bulkers now that were built for 20 to 25 years getting retired at 15 because the rate environment got ugly. I assume 30 years life of the steel on the cargo compartment, so a converted vessel, I'll look at as being 30 years with the original build being 40 maybe lasting, but that again is going to be driven by rates. If the rates are good, they'll stay in service. If the market is tight, then the oil company's vetting departments are a little looser in what they'll allow, but if the market gets looser, then you're going to see a lot more of the older coin coming out pretty quickly. Okay, so um, I'm going to repeat your question. Um, he asked about uh, what happened when we recently changed our methodology for crude oil production data. Uh, this is our monthly data. So we have a survey known as the 914 that goes out to oil and gas producers in the United States. And um, prior to recent, <laughs> I'll say, because it was a staggered rollout, um, we used to get it directly from state energy offices, and we had problems. We only got it from, I forget how many states, and many of them were horribly delayed, and we had to do a lot of imputation, which is a creative way of saying analyst judgment, to backfill where there was missing data. So um, we came up with a new improved form to go out to the actual producers. And I believe it's 22 states that we're covering now. And it was really important for us to include places like Pennsylvania, you know, where we were seeing um, Marcellus and Utica development. Uh, I think we were missing a, a number of important states that really mattered. And so they just rolled out the second part of it, which I think it, we rolled out the gas first, then we rolled out the oil. And I think it just came out this past month. And then the, the third part is the APIs. So the actual gravity of the crude is also being collected, but the data was not very good when we started seeing it. So I um, actually carpool with the guy who oversees all of this, so I hear about this a lot. Um, the hope is that it would come out at year end. Um, and so the methodology is it's coming to, from producers as opposed to state. We have a, a greater number of respondents in the frame. Frame is a euphemistic term we use for who's been uh, selected to be a respondent on our survey. And um, it, everyone believes that the estimation done more realistically reflects what's going on. In addition to what we have there, which is total production, we also have the drilling productivity report, which is not interfaced with that, and that's just totally focused on shale and light plays. And so we have uh, a report, we'll have a gas uh, one-pager and an oil one-pager for each of those seven plays. And we don't provide state-level data, but there is an effort afoot to get those reports to spell it out so we can see the state-specific data. At that point, then, it probably will be um, integrated a lot closer with our actual crude production data. And to add on that, could you also speak about crude by rail data, whether there will be any other product by rail data, and whether you'll do any surveying of that? Um, well, right now, when, when we went live, we were using data from the Surface Transportation Board, 
And so it's primarily way build data as well as something else called quarterly commodity statistics. And every single product is available in there and they use a different kind of product code. So it's been a, a voyage of discovery for us to figure out how to use this data, how to best make it sing. Uh, the first products we're going after are propane and ethanol. And they are probably going to be rolled out in about the January time frame. And so the, well, our, my goal is again to roll it out five years of data all at once back to 2010. After that, we're also looking at propylene, natural gasoline. I'd, we're sort of figuring out where we want to go. It all is dependent upon how much noise there is in the data. If we find that the noisiness in the data is greater than the actual volumes, we won't produce it because it's just, it's, it's too weird. And so we want to have something where we're really confident in it. Now, the way build data we're getting it from is not everything. It's a sample. People say it's less than a 2% sample. So we're using this data. We're expanding it out using these factors that the Surface Transportation Board provides us and then growing it out further. That's part of the issue why we'll never go state level reporting um, because it, it is such a small sample, it would really um, just skew what we're seeing result-wise. So in addition, um, what um, Nicole's alluding to is um, when we went forth with our proposal, every three years we say, oh, it's time we can change our surveys a little bit. And for 2016, we went and all the petroleum surveys, and there must be like 20 of them, we went out and said, look, these are the changes we're proposing. And the comment period just ended in September. And the 817, which is one that we currently do for barges and tankers, we decided to wrap rail in there. And we would then request the data directly from uh, the shippers, you know, the, the oil companies, rather than going after railroads. And so that is currently being proposed. It has not been approved. We're taking our comments and looking at them. It has to get OMB approval. But if it does happen sometime in mid-2016, we could see data coming that way, but it would probably be validated against what we're seeing in our Surface Transportation Board-based data. And then maybe by the end of the year, we go live with just our survey data. It all depends on what happens. Minnie, can I ask a quick follow-up question? After the uh, horrendous accident up in Canada where 47 people were killed by a runaway crew train, U.S. passed legislation that each state, the railroads had to advise each state of the rail cars carrying crude so they could get in place response capability to any accidents. Have you tapped into that, Dania? Well, yet? We, we work together with this, um, FRA, the Federal Railroad Administration, uh, the Department of Transportation, and they've been the one who have been dealing with all of that. But um, we don't, I mean, it's sad to say, but we don't worry about safety. Mm -hmm. So we're more a volumetric bean counter rather than um, getting involved in that. Though we definitely do see the impacts of those things and, and expect that it will impact uh, rail movements. Um, but it's our understanding, like when they first started having that data come out so you can see county pathways. We thought, oh, this is great. We'll be able to map this thing, really, and see it. But then um, the railroads um, had a bunch of suits, and, and some of the states started um, getting a little nervous about revealing first responder um, types of information and, and which communities the cars were actually moving through. So we, we haven't done anything more with that. Yeah, I'd love to hear more about the new safety requirements on rail. John, do you have any sense of how that's impacting the industry so far? Well, there's, uh, there's really two things from a, from a, from a safety perspective. Uh, the one that everybody's heard about is that the new regulations uh, on, the, uh, on the tank cars uh, used in the, for the movement of, of, of flammable liquids, which would include, include crude oil and, and ethanol. And uh, you know, the, you know the, the, the bottom line is that the, the, the the uh, you know the standards you know basically require the retrofit of every car that's in that service now, or virtually every car that's uh, that that's that's in that service. Um, and you know there was a, there was a lot of you know when the rule was first started, there was a lot of hand wringing and you know how are shops going to have the capacity to you know to, uh, to 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 do all these all these retrofits. Um, but you know that's sort of calmed down now that there are, there are uh, 
pr probably half of the, all the cars that moved crude oil in 2014 are in storage right now. And uh, and a as usual in the rail car cycle, all the all the uh, all the all the brand new cars that the last sets of brand new cars that are coming off the assembly line are going right into storage. It's the uh, it's the uh, um, you know th uh, a year and a half ago you know it would it would have cost you three three thousand thirty five hundred dollars a month uh, for uh, to, uh, to 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 lease to to lease the mo most modern rail car you can. I probably get you all you want for eight fifty right now uh, on a full service lease for two or for two or three years. Um, so I, I think when it comes to uh, you know so I think w when it comes to retrofits, there's I think I think there's there's two things that, that that people should be looking at. You know, one is the standards for a retrofit car are not the same as the standards for a new car. Uh, you know, the you know the bottom line is this new car requires a, a, a thicker thicker tank tank shell of nine nine sixteenth. Uh, most of the cars in that service now are seven sixteenth. Um, so if you're a if you're a crude oil, and I've, I've actually I've, I've actually asked this question or posed this question to, to CEOs of, of, of several clients in this uh, in this business, they said you know when the next accident happens and it will because the new tank car standards will not prevent the same you know the same type of answer. If you hit a car hard enough, it's going to blow up. It's got the same commodity in it, just the same as just the same as the old ones did. Um, are you, you gonna? How comfortable are you gonna be? You know, fitting, sitting in front of the uh, Senate committee and saying when the when the senator asked you, did you do everything you could to prevent this accident? And uh, and you 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 know you said, well, we, we used a car that complied with the retrofit regulations. So so the senator will say the answer to that question then would be no, because if you had a new car, that that new car is uh, is, is stronger and so forth. So I I just don't think that the uh, that the uh, that the whole retrofit thing is going to be uh, is going to be as big a problem as it as it was even if even if volume comes back I, I just don't see a bunch of a bunch of uh, companies spending forty or fifty or sixty grand to uh, you know to retrofit rail cars um, uh, you know new ones will be a hundred and fifty thousand but uh, but um, I you know I think it, you know it's going to happen you know people you know eventually the, some of those cars will find their way into ethanol service. Um, and you know the uh, I, I think the you know folks who move in crude oil are going to be are going to be you know mostly mostly using new cars. John, can I ask you a quick follow-up mm -hmm. question? The uh, the maritime industry went through a similar thing after the Exxon Valdez oil spill, where they had to either retrofit or retire every single hull tank tanker and replace it with double hulls. But the real driver of the greatly improved safety record was the increasing of the liability limits. Are there liability limits in the rail industry and how are those being impacted? Um, there are not, not, not like you would, not like you would, um, uh, you know, not like you would see in the, the you know, in what you're talking about in the marine industry or even, or even that exists for, you know, for the nuclear power industry, like, you know, that the, there's, a, there's a backstop stop there. Um, it, you know, it's been talked about in the rail business, but mostly in, irrelevant to the movement of commodities like chlorine and anhydrous ammonia that are uh, um, toxic by inhalation or poisonous by inhalation. That uh, um, if you're a railroad, if you're a prudent business person, you would never handle a commodity like that because the next accident is an enterprise threatening, uh, uh, it will be an enterprise threatening event, but they have a common carrier obligation, they have to handle it. Um, so it, uh, um, but there's, I, I haven't, I've, I've heard some of that talk, you know, from, from a crude by rail perspective, but not, not a lot. I don't think it's, if it's, uh, if it isn't going to be put in place for chlorine, I don't see it for crude oil. Well, with, in the maritime industry, they significantly increased the liability limit, and that was the big driver of change and reduction of accidents as opposed to imposing reduced liability limits, which is what you just mentioned. Right. Well, the railroads have their own. The railroads have their. I mean, it's you know they are liable for you know for uh, you know for, for, for whatever whatever happens. They they have made several attempts, again in the in the arena of, of of poisonous by inhalation and toxic by inhalation to push that liability onto uh, the the liability for uh, to third parties, uh, you know for you know communities or people that are that are harmed by an accident to to their uh, to their to their to their really to their customers, but uh, 
you know, it's really been, uh, it, it, you know, the, the, so far they, they haven't really been successful in, in, in doing that, but they'll, you know, I think they'll, you know, ultimately the, the, the best solution would be for the industry and the, and the railroads to, to agree amongst themselves on how that liability to third parties would be, uh, would, would be allocated. Maritime was not successful in pushing liability onto the cargo owners. It stayed with the ship owner. It uh, in the uh, in the in the railroad business, there's a, there's a lot of things you can do with your monopoly power. It isn't all about price. <laughs> <laughs> uh, was there a hand back there? Nope. Okay, I can go on. Yeah, there's a lot of barges smaller. What I was capturing in my analysis or what I consider the inter-regional or inner pad, the true coast-wise movements, you do have a lot of barges in the 80 and 50,000 range that are ocean-going barges, but they mainly stay within a very limited range like New York Harbor or the Puget Sound or something like that. And so my report and effort really focuses on the coast-wise movement as opposed to local and then the inland barges are about 30,000 barrel barges the big ones in that trade and so I, I don't cover that market either in my report but that the down the Mississippi trade really ended as I said earlier and so what, um, I'm sorry, what size are the, ATVs? the ATVs that I cover are from about 140,000 up 140,000 barrel capacity upwards and then what's below that, as I said, are usually mostly regional. Okay, great. So to move on to the crude oil export ban, um, a lot of the discussion, I think, in the industry is about the export ban and how it would interact with the Jones Act and whether any of those regulations are also being reconsidered in light of the export ban being reconsidered. So I'd love to hear from our panelists about what the impact of, the, of lifting the export ban could be on U.S. shipping and transportation, and then how that would interact with the lifting of or the not lifting of the Jones Act. Well, I, I did a study for the American Maritime Partnership, which is a lobbying group for the Jones Act, and virtually every maritime organization in the U.S. is a member. And our conclusions when we did some global modeling of the crude oil trade mm -hmm. was that there'd be very little impact on Jones Act movements. We might lose some Eagle Ford movements that are occasional or up to the Northeast refineries. Those refineries may want to get a little bit heavier crude. They're currently running about 50% Bakken. And so the Eagle Ford that had wanted to go up there probably wouldn't. You'd get Nigerian filling in, and then you'd probably see that Eagle Ford. Right now it's been moving to Korea or industrialized or high growth Asian countries and a little bit over to Europe or a little bit to Latin America. It's just a little, it's too light for most of our refiners. So we saw very limited impact. So the Jones Act guys are kind of sitting on the sideline in that debate unless the refiners start claiming they need to get rid of the Jones Act and then they jump right up quickly. Uh, so so I have a, a, a little bit different take on it. Um, I, I don't really have a lot of maritime experience at all, but um, I have sat through some of these um, or like I said, met with some of the members and sat through uh, a hearing at the Senate Natural Resources Committee um, and some of this other stuff. And I think that my understanding is that it's, um, there's just uh, folks, some folks that don't want the export ban lifted uh, just as a legislative tactic or trying to tie it to the Jones Act, which brings in, which has a whole lot more supporters and a whole lot more heft on Capitol Hill as a way to weigh down the efforts to repeal um, the crude oil export ban. So that's like my understanding kind of the, the Is that a successful of, strategy? Um, I, I, well, it hasn't been lifted yet, right? It's so, actually a pretty bad strategy because we've got the Jones Act lobby against the refiners. Yeah, so I, I think, um, I think it's actually backfired to, to some extent uh, against them and, um, and um, like I, I remember like I met with uh, Joe Manchin from uh, West Virginia, a senator, and um, and he, he basically went went on a rail with me about what do the two things have to do and we should be considering them each independently and like he was upset that it was they were trying to tie the two together. 
And then what would the effect of lifting the export ban be on crude oil movements within the U.S.? Where would we see flows shift and change or types of transportation change? And given where oil prices are right now, would there be much of an impact at all? Well, I can't answer all of that, but I can say that EIA uh, recently put out a study where we looked at different cases out to the year 2025. And um, what we did, if, if you guys are familiar with our annual energy outlook, we do a number of limited side cases. And one of the ones we do is high resource case, which means excess oil and gas production domestically. And we tied that together with a low oil price case. So it's a combo, and we looked at the way that different things would happen. We didn't see a huge price impact on consumers in the United States. We did not get into uh, the uh, transportation mode impacts regionally, um, but that study is available on our website. Yeah, what we saw long term in it was if crude production kept going up, the big growth in crude production, the U.S. is light, tight oil is light oil, we are awash in light oil, our Gulf Coast refiners like heavier oil, so there, there was a potential that it, in ex, lifting the export ban would limit the growth in the movement of light, tight oil by any mode because it couldn't be used anywhere unless you lifted the ban and would in effect force it to stay in the ground. Uh, but we haven't gotten to that either. People call it the crude wall or the day of reckoning and the price collapse has kind of slowed the growth, so we're not looking at hitting that right now, but we're still reasonably close to it in pad three at least. I think from a rail perspective, there's probably probably not a not a not a lot unless there's you know you're, you're starting to build export terminals on the east coast or the west coast. Um, it, it'd be I think most of it would want to go to the Gulf or originate in the Gulf. Also recognize that the uh, crude oil that we produce, Eagle Ford, which is the lightest crude oil, uh, BIS has also given permission to export that now. You have to segregate it and run it through a field stabilizer, but most of it is run through a field stabilizer to make it safe for pipeline transportation. So, and you're allowed to export ANS right now as well in limited amounts of California heavy crude, and we have unlimited rights to export to Canada, and our biggest exports by a factor of 10 are to Canada right now. Right, and then crude oil swaps to Mexico were recently approved. We on a case-by-case -case basis. On a case-by-case -case basis. So what is the effect so far that those small release valves are having in the U.S.? Are we seeing large growth in those exports? Well, it's, it's funny. One of the things that we've been seeing is the impact on proposed condensate splitters. So we've seen an impact more on projects of stationary infrastructure for producing and um, manipulating into some level of products rather than on the transportation mode. Yeah, I've done some work on the uh, condensate splitters, mainly from the perspective of terminal capacity for moving the cargoes. And as we were able to point out where the condensate splitters were being put in, we were still importing the products that the condensate splitter was going to make. So it was either going to stop the imports or would have negligible impact on the, the couple that we looked at. Mm -hmm. Question? Yeah, I have a question uh, what happens after the export ban is lifted in this context. Uh, I'm sure for that is that the movement of the light crew is not independent of the movement of the heavy crew because the finally at the end of the day use a blended strategy to mimic their crew. So these two movements are not independent and till the ban is there We expected the ban to stay in place for a long time. We'd see refineries modifying by putting in outboard flash towers or things like that. So they, they in effect, make the light crude into a heavier crude. Uh, but if the ban gets lifted, we'll see a minimal of those big investments in refinery modifications done, which is a, a logical thing. So we'll see some of our lightest, as I said, Eagle Ford getting exported and some more heavier crudes being imported, such as the Mexican swaps would achieve. That's my... Yeah. That, that, that's what I... Just to follow up, 
And there may Well, I was going to say, you know, another impact, of course, is on the exporting of products, because we're a huge exporter of products nowadays. So would a refiner that has access to certain crude basically say, you know what, I'm going to run my units a little differently, or maybe it's time for me to mothball this MacGyvered refinery and, uh, or you know, ship it to India or whatever the heck they want to do and make that crude available to exports. So I would, the way we see it is there'll be an impact on product exports. And then that has its own set of transportation implications because we do have product pipelines that run all over, although there is no way to get across the Rockies. So, you know, there's like one or two small ones, but not significantly by pipeline. And then your follow-up question was about the effect of lifting the ban on transportation movements of heavy crude, is that right? Yeah. Any thoughts on that? Well, we're, when we um, started, so when we came live with the crude by rail, we decided to include cross-border Canada movements in both directions. Initially, we started seeing what we thought were oil sand based movements coming in. It turned out that in addition to what we were seeing crude-wise, there was a solid bitumen, undiluted bitumen, that was also coming across from Canada to the US. And it was coming in on a code that we didn't anticipate. So it took us a while to sort of figure this all out, and we've incorporated that into our data now. But it's not huge. And that stuff is going to either the Gulf Coast or the East Coast refineries where they can handle it. It likes so, to go to asphalt refineries. It can, too. Yep. And so we're, we're seeing that. But it, it's not really, really big volumes. Yep, back there. My question kind of deals with what's kind of a gray area between, I think, all of you. Because, I mean, what I'm hearing is there's there's obviously a lot of export demand lifting talk. There's not always as much talk on, on the mobility of the logistics around lifting the export demand, which is kind of what everyone's dancing around, I think, right now. But what I'm really curious about is listening. I mean, and first of all, I'm agnostic on this. I, I, don't, I, don't, I totally agree. I trade oil. It's a rent market with product prices. Trade upstream and downstream, so I've seen it from both sides of it. Um, but I am interested when I hear things. I mean, the, the, the linkage of the export ban and the Jones Act, I mean, it's, it, there is a linkage there because, I mean, really, what you're talking about the arbitrage of two different trade rates, really. Uh, and it really does put, I mean, if you go all out and just lift all exports, which is interesting right now because I don't think as many barrels can leave because on my screen I can't see an economic barrel to move out of here. Uh, but I mean, you do put the entire East Coast kind of behind the gun on this because in order for them to move crude even by rail, because there's no pipeline stated, and that's right, you got to move the crude by rail and get moved by boat. And they're going to have to use the Jones Act vessel when the competition, say, in Europe or wherever else you're going to send these theoretical light barrels to, is going to be using a much cheaper mode of transportation or freight. It would put them kind of behind, you know, an eight ball here. I mean, you know, I don't know what it is right now. I can look at the freight rates, but I mean, it used to be four or five dollars. Now it's probably more three because I mean, But I mean, is it really fair to delink the two? Well, when we started looking at that in the, the global modeling, as I said, the only thing we really saw was some of the Eagle Ford moving up to Philadelphia right. was the stuff at risk, but the moves over to Louisiana wasn't at risk from the export ban. And crude likes to go where it wants to go, where it gets its highest net back. So, you know, it's easier to move discount it at the wellhead to force it into Philadelphia if you need to, whether it's Bakken or one or the others, as opposed to, you know, just saying, well, it can't compete with this cheaper transport mode with Nigeria, and it's just a question of how do you price the crude at the wellhead? And if the price is such that it won't move there, then that means it has an alternative market to go to. I've got a follow-up for you. So with Jones Act being, what is it relative to a foreign vessel right now? To double still? We don't have it moving on identical Size. pathways, but in general, when we looked at it on certain trade routes across the Gulf with clean products, not with crude, it was about double. Okay. But remember that was assuming that you could move it in a foreign flag tanker that didn't pay any taxes, didn't have to comply with our 
know, labor laws or subject to any form of state regulation or liability from the U.S. and all that. So. Okay, so Panama Canal coming, mm -hmm. du doubled, right? Um, and we've heard stuff, though, again, I have no way to judge this, that uh, there will be vessels that will be taking it from the Gulf and moving it to the West Coast. So. Uh -huh through the Panama Canal, and because there'll be a change in vessel or some kind of lightering potentially happening, they can avoid all of the Jones Act requirements. And you can't avoid the Jones Act requirements with lightering. Okay. When BP was moving oil back in the early days of Alaska, they would lighter into a smaller vessel to go through the Panama Canal, and they had to be Jones Act on both sides. To get around the Jones Act, you have to do serious manufacturing of the goods. So if you landed crude oil, at a foreign refinery, you would have to refine it before you could move it in a foreign flag vessel. Now, how about the Caribbean points where um, we've been seeing, so what was left of Hovensa and some of the other facilities, they sort of remain out there and we've heard talk about things being brought there. There is the, the Borco exemption, mm -hmm. which was put in place. Hovensa is part of the U.S., part of, it's on the Virgin Islands, but it does have an exemption from the Jones Act. Uh, there was a ruling by BIS that if you moved gasoline blend components to Borco, which is in the Bahamas, you would then you could then move it on a foreign flag tanker, and then you could re-import to the U.S. the blended finished gasoline. We saw it looks like a little bit of that move last year when it was first passed. Virtually nothing did because when we did the transportation economics, there was nothing left to pay the blender. And so this year there was a little bit, but if Jones Act rates come down just a little bit, that gets shut down right away too. Thanks. Did you have a question? Yeah, in addition Uh, there was so the we, questions about congestion for marine movement in the Eagleford. Yeah, at the, corp, at the docks at Corpus Christi, when we first started, you know, really ramping up Eagle Ford, they had real good pipeline capacity to get to the docks. Uh, we did a lot of looking at voyage durations and the average duration two years ago for a tanker going from Corpus Christi to Loop was on the order of 15 days, whereas mathematically it could be six days. The average dropped about a year or so ago to seven days. It's climbed up a little bit to nine days again. But we think most of the congestion has gone away because they opened up a couple new docks down there, Traffic Era and a few others. I crawled through those docks and looked at them and met with people down there. And it, they've really cleaned up the backlog, except for on the barges. There's still inland barge issues a little bit there, but they, just, they have a priority on docking product tankers first, ocean going barges second, and then inland barges, because they can stack the inland barges better. Can you frame that same question in condensate export? Uh, again, there's plenty of export capacity for the condensate out of there. One of the limitations right now is on vessel size. Uh, they are limited with a 45 foot draft, so they have to light load a little bit, but their bridge there also has an air draft issue. So it's kind of a combination that they, they can't get big volumes out of it, but they're replacing that bridge, I think, in 2018. So I think you'll be able to go up to about 150,000 dead weight at that time, but again, still a little bit light loaded tankers. So you can probably get about a 700,000 barrel lot size, whereas now we're limited to about 330. Except on the, uh, the two big Alaskan tankers there, I think can do about 570,000 barrel lot sizes. Out of corpus. Great, we have time for about one more question. Yes. Follow up on the, the answer the, use the Panama Canal example. If you had if you had an oil export of the land, uh, van, van Lindsay, let's just say it's carte blanche. Mm -hmm. If basically if I had a lighter basically in order to get because a lot of these ports are relative to the shallow water ports and I can't bring a massive boat in here to get scale. If I have the lighter out of the port to the vessel offshore, would I have to use a Jones Act vessel to do that lighter? Depends on where that vessel was parked. Uh, if it's within the U.S. three-mile limit, you have to use Jones Act. Right now in the Gulf of Mexico, the lightering vessels do not have to be Jones Act. If you're 
bringing things in. Um, so it, it depends on where you want to do the lightering. In Delaware Bay, it's all Jones Act lightering, but in the Gulf of Mexico, the deep water lightering, bringing in product on VLCCs is done on foreign, but that's, again, foreign, it's part of a foreign transit still. And so it, it again, depends where you park it and where it is in the, the system where it is in the system, but you can use, in general, imports can go on a lighter vessel in foreign, unless it's within that three mile range, I think. And I'm not certain on the three, it may be 24, I don't know, but I know Philadelphia has to be Jones Act for lightering, but the Gulf of Mexico does not. Thank you. Okay, great, and I think with that, we will cede the floor to the next presentation. Thank you all so much.